shortness of breath. So some of the signs and symptoms for shortness of breath is usually breathing difficulty, when someone has difficulty breathing. Um, they can have breathing difficulty either by being anxious, by having a panic attack, uh, so at some point they'll eventually hyperventilate because not enough oxygen is able to get into um, the lungs. We can also tell somebody is having breathing difficulty because they're in a, what we call a tripoding state. And so they're leaning over, which you can see from the picture, and then their hands are on their knees, and they're literally in a tripod um, The skin may be pale or bluish, so the lack of oxygen, and so the body is pulling the oxygen away from the extremities and to the core. Um, you may be able to ask them if the airway is constricted a little bit, and then if the airway is constricted, then you have to find the mechanism in terms of why is the airway being constricted. Drugs is a big issue, and especially in North American with the op opiates uh, crisis. Um, it's a respiratory situation, and so you would actually need to provide rescue breaths. One rescue breath for every five seconds. And we'll get in more into that uh, a little bit later on today. So allergic reaction, which you can see sometimes happen in the wilderness first aid setting, because they may be exposed to different variants for the first time, especially in a wilderness first aid setting. But the allergic reaction can also happen for suburban areas. So for allergic reaction, the body vasodilates. So it pushes all the bad stuff uh, to the core or to the skin area, usually the capillary of the body. And so if you don't know what vasodilates means, you should definitely check out our circulatory system video. And we talk about that. So the histamines are initiated for the inflammatory response. The blood pushes up against the capillary, or the capillary blood, um, is sometimes expanded so much that it actually pushes past the capillaries and then it forms the hives because the capillaries itself cannot contain the blood. So when someone is having an allergic reaction, it is very important to provide the antihistamines. And there's a multitude of antihistamines that you can provide to the patient. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. So in a wilderness first aid setting, it's very important that you wait f uh, to provide the EpiPen until the patient actually has difficulty breathing. So I'm going to reiterate that again. It is very important in a wilderness first aid setting that you wait to provide the EpiPen until the person is having, having difficulty breathing. Um, in a regular area or suburban area, the person uh, usually can get to a hospital within 15 to 20 minutes. So also I want to reiterate about the EpiPen that it is not a cure, it is not a fix. It is just a temporary band-aid. What will actually work is the antihistamines, the over-the-counter over the counter antihistamines. And then to hydrate because when you use the uh, EpiPen it dries out the um, respiratory tract. And so it's very important that the person hydrates. Uh, so we're going to watch a short video on how to use an EpiPen. The first step in being prepared for a severe allergic reaction, also called anaphylaxis, is having an EpiPen on hand at all times. But your EpiPen won't do you any good if you don't know how to use it. Take some time now to become familiar with your EpiPen, so, should you need it, you'll be ready. For starters, you should be aware of the symptoms that you may experience during a severe allergic reaction. These can include hives, swelling and itching, shortness of breath or chest tightness, cramps, nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, a sharp drop in blood pressure, 
and if you don't act quickly enough, you could even lose consciousness. Epinephrine by injection is the treatment of choice for anaphylactic reactions because it quickly begins working to constrict blood vessels, relax muscles in the lungs to improve breathing, stimulate the heartbeat, and reverse hives and swelling around the face and lips. Your EpiPen contains a single, pre-measured dose of epinephrine. Using your EpiPen is easy. First, remove it from the plastic tube. Grasp the unit with your dominant hand. Your thumb should be closest to the end with the gray safety release cap, but not over the cap. Then use your other hand to remove the safety release cap. Once the cap is removed, be sure not to touch the black tip at the other end of the EpiPen. This is where the needle comes out. Hold the EpiPen with the black tip toward your outer thigh. Now, swing and jab the EpiPen firmly at a 90-degree angle into your thigh. Your EpiPen is spring-loaded and is designed to be used through clothing. Keep the EpiPen firmly against your thigh for approximately 10 seconds. Then, remove the EpiPen and massage the injection site for another 10 seconds. Check the small clear window on the side of the EpiPen. If you see the red plunger in the window, it means that the epinephrine has been injected. Also, look to see if the needle is coming out of the black tip. Next, take your used EpiPen and without bending the needle, carefully put it back into its plastic carrying tube, needle end first, then screw the cap on completely. This will automatically lock the EpiPen into the tube for safety. It's important to remember that once you've used your EpiPen, you must seek medical attention. Call 911 immediately or have someone else take you to an emergency room as soon as possible. This is crucial because after 15 to 20 minutes, the effects of epinephrine begin to wear off. Remember to take your used EpiPen with you to the hospital and be sure to give it to your physician for inspection and proper disposal. Before leaving the hospital, be sure to ask for a new EpiPen prescription. It's also a good idea to see an allergist as soon as you can. For more information about EpiPen, visit our website at www.epipen.com. Once there, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for the EpiPen Center for Anaphylactic Support, your free information resource for severe allergic reactions, where you'll find valuable offers and tips to help you stay prepared. Rem remember, you can't always predict when you will have a severe allergic reaction, but if you have an EpiPen with you, you will always be prepared. All right, excellent. So some of the over-counter uh, antihistamines, and that's what OT stands, OTC stands for, over-the-counter. The primary one that we usually utilize is the Benadryl. Um, and then I would use a secondary one um, it, on the list because some people are a actually allergic to Benadryl. Um, and any over-the-counter uh, medicine that I use to try to treat a symptom or a sign um, I would always bring in a second um, over-the-counter medicine so that way if somebody is allergic to something I have a um, secondary use. So um, with Benadryl if we were to read the Benadryl description it says to administer 25 to 50 milligrams for an adult. Um, how much would we actually provide the adult? Uh, what did I say before? That is correct, the full amount. So you would provide 50 milligrams for the adult. And you would f provide 50 milligrams every four hours for 24 hours. And that's usually when the allergen will remain in the system up to 24 hours. And as I stated before, the EpiPen is just a band-aid. The actual antihistamines is the one that is going to um, make sure all that al allergen stuff is out of the system. So I want to talk to you about um, using the EpiPen and the antihistamines um, coinciding sort of together and how it works together. So that way you have a clear picture of why we just don't use the antihistamine and then at the same time use the EpiPen. So we've just injected the person, um, or not injected the person, we just gave the person uh, antihistamines. And so uh, you notice that someone is, ha is having an allergic reaction, so you give them the antihistamine. And then it takes about 20 to 25 minutes for the antihistamine to start actually working into the system and into the body and doing what it's supposed to. So uh, let me re-advise that again. 20 to 25 minutes before it actually starts working. It doesn't automatically start working in the system or in the body. It, take, it does take some time. So as you can see with the line, the person is going to have a breathing problem. 
um, even before the antihistamine sort of activates and fully into effect. So that's why it's very important to wait until um, the person does have a breathing issue so that way you can provide the EpiPen and give them the 15 minute band-aid so that way the antihistamine um, can sort of overlap with the EpiPen or there is a certain overlap time and it's about five minutes if everything is done correctly and then eventually the EpiPen will wear off and then that's where you see it going down but we're not that worried about it anymore because you've already provided once you saw the allergen uh, the antihistamine so then the antihistamine will actually take over so this is the most uh, conducive uh, method and way um, to utilize both so unfortunately uh, some people they get really nervous um, and they're trying to help the person as fast as possible so they try to do both uh, they provide the antihistamine and they provide the EpiPen at the same time which uh, to be honest is actually catastrophic for the person um, so you see the allergen and then you wait until the breathing problem arises and then you're like oh my gosh let me provide um, the antihistamine and so the antihistamine um, as I said once again 20 to 25 minutes before it actually kicks in and then you're like oh the person is having a breathing problem at the same time too let me provide the EpiPen so you provide the EpiPen and um, there's a 15 minute wait most of the time as I said 15 minute band-aid and the EpiPen is actually working and then eventually it won't work anymore but then we have this five minutes of time where nothing is intertwined um, in between. There's no overlap of the antihistamine um, or the EpiPen. And this is really, really bad for the person. Um, the person will feel really, really bad. A very volatile position. Um, and especially out in the outback for witness first aid setting, there's really nothing else you can do. Um, maybe, hopefully, if you have another EpiPen, because they usually come in two doses or two canisters, you can provide another EpiPen, and so that way you can prolong um, the EpiPen and give 15 more minutes, so that way you'll, you'll have time for the antihistamine to actually activate. So breathing easy is another mechanism of, I wouldn't say trying to calm down the person, um, but try to put the person at ease. The first thing is get them out of the environment. Um, if the person is exercising and that's the reason why the person is anxious or breathing heavily or having an asthma attack, get them out of that condition. Have them stop what they're doing. Um, depending if maybe um, the breathing heavily is due to altitude, bring them down 100, 200 feet in altitude. We'll talk about hape and haste a little bit later on. Um, you know, if it's a storm cloud or if it's dusty, you're hiking along the Sahara Desert, um, bring them out of that dust storm, you know, cover them up. Um, just get them out of the environment. Or get them um, to stop what they're doing that was creating uh, the condition. Talk to the patient about something totally different. So if someone is anxious or if someone is having a panic attack and, you know, their mind and focus is zooming in on that injury, on that problem, on that situation, talk about something totally different. And this really, really helps. Usually when, you know, someone um, has just seen a vehicle crash or if someone has just seen a stick um, fall down on somebody's head, um, I take some other people away while someone else treats them or maybe I'm the one treating them and then I have um, someone else take uh, the other people away and we talk about something totally different. We're like, okay, how's the weather today? Um, you know, look at these trees. Um, look at these beautiful flowers. Um, what did we do yesterday? Talk about something totally different so that way their mind is not continuously focused on uh, the situation at hand. So if that doesn't work, and that's usually sort of a quick fix, um, then I would actually ask the person um, or the persons, if there's a multitude of people, to either form a circle and then we would do some breathing techniques. So either sometimes I would demonstrate a breathing technique and then I'll have them demonstrate it back to me, or I would have them do the breathing technique with me. So I'll say, okay, we're going to breathe in and then we're going to breathe out. And then we do that for one second at a time. We breathe in for one second, then we breathe out for one second. 
and then I do this three or four times. Um, so that way it gets them enough oxygen into the body so that way they're not hyperventilating. Relax the person, make them comfortable. Um, sometimes, you know, giving them a jacket, warming them up a little bit, um, hot chocolate, um, hot water uh, helps out substantially. Or have them sit down, maybe sit down even on a rock. Um, so if it's a sunny day, the rock, you know, is um, being warmed by the sun. So and you're having them sit down. So two birds with one stone um, or two birds with one rock. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And it's whatever makes the patient comfortable. Uh, sometimes what we perceive as comfortable is not comfortable to the patient. So we're trying to make the patient comfortable, not necessarily, you know, that we think it's comfortable for them. So if the person feels comfortable standing up, have the person stand up. If the person would rather sit than recline, have the person uh, sit up than re recline back. Um, so what is comfortable to the patient may, dif may be different what's comfortable for you. So asthma is another big um, issue that we have, especially not only in the wilderness first aid setting, because um, they're uh, in different conditions for wilderness first aid setting that they may not be um, back home. But you can use this back home also. So with asthma, they can inhale normally, and then usually when they exhale, that's when they end up wheezing. And you can see to the picture to the right-hand side, uh, the normal lung, the muscle is relaxed, and then in asthmatic lung, the muscle tightens. And this has the swollen lining and excessive mucus. So because the person is not able to take in uh, the full amount of oxygen, uh, the air becomes stale in their lungs. And this is um, pretty bad. Remove the person once again from the environment um, that may be causing them to have the um, asthma attack. Use the rescue inhaler that is prescribed. Um, most of the time they know how to use it. Um, if they need assistance maybe, then assist them in helping them use it. So people have, uh, the new technique in terms of an inhaler has been maybe for the last 50 years, but people have been having asthma attacks for the last thousands of years. So there's um, some conditional methods, um, or holistic methods, whatever you want to call it. Um, and one of the methods is the pierced lip um, breathing. So with the pierced lip breathing, uh, which the instructor will demonstrate after um, this video, uh, the back of the pressure, or it backs up the pressure in the lungs, it holds in the air uh, for a longer period of time, allowing for more time to get the gas exchange to happen, allowing for oxygen um, to get into the lungs and into the bloodstream. And that's what the pierced lip breathing technique. So the rib compression. So basically you take both hands and you um, firmly and uh, firmly squeeze the area um, inward a little bit. And so you do that because you allow all the stale air out while the breathing in and out. You keep squeezing a little bit more and a little bit more. Uh, so you're getting all that stale air out. So after the third and fourth time of a full cycle, so a full cycle is a person breathing in and then out, you release your hands from the rib um, cage. And so after the third or fourth time, the person is able to fully take in more air, allowing for fresh air into the system. So that stagnant air is not just staying there. And that actually does uh, wonders. And then of course, you can also use an EpiPen. Um, so if any of the other two methods don't work, then you can definitely utilize an EpiPen. Uh, that should not be the first thing that you use, though. Um, that's about third, maybe fourth on the list um, if the person does not have an uh, inhaler. And the EpiPen usually works because it bronchodilates um, along the lungs. As it says before, it... Uh, um, the muscle relaxes and stuff like that. And then once again, with the EpiPen, uh, even when someone is having an asthma attack, you also want to provide them the full dose of antihistamines too. And then once again, you would want uh, to hydrate the person um, because using well, epinephrine, uh, it does dry out the respiratory tract. 
So literally, you're trying to help them, and then you use the EpiPen, and then you're back to square one. Uh, so you definitely do want to hydrate the patient.